Hey, my name is Matt Williams. I'm the lead pastor here. If you're a guest with us today, I am so glad that you're here uh, visiting with us. And uh, if you're watching online, we know that a lot of people will watch online before they come to church to kind of check it out. So I want to welcome you if you're watching online with us this morning. So I want to start today and, and, and tell you about um, uh, a, a story that I saw. And, and maybe you guys saw this too, but there was a ESPN reporter that got her, her car towed. And there was this viral video that went around of her at the tow truck station trying to get her car back, just ripping into the the cashier um, at the tow truck station. I don't know if you guys saw that. I would play the video, but it's so horrible. Like, I think... I think it would be bad. But she's over there just, just ripping on this, this person, and, uh, and she's drawing them because her car got towed. Her car got towed because she parked it illegally someplace, and, and so it, it deserves, like there's a sign and everything. We're going to tow your car away. So they towed her car away, and she comes out in there kind of like, don't you know who I am? She comes in rolling hard like that, right? And then she starts making fun of the cashier, saying stuff like, well, I have a college education. That's why I don't work in a place like this. And then starts making fun of her weight and says, well, if I was missing teeth, maybe they'd hire me to work here too. And like, just terrible. In the very beginning, when she starts ripping into this, the lady's like, ma'am, if you could just calm down a little bit. You're on camera. There's a camera right here. And she looks at the camera and then just continues to just verbally destroy this lady. And, and she says, don't you know who I am? She says her name and everything and what she does for a living. She's like, I'm on TV all day long. You know, on and on and on and on and on. And sure enough, it's all over. They, 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 the, the tow truck company was like, well, we're now going to make you famous for this. And so they, they air it all over the place. And, and, and then it goes, it goes nuts, right? It goes all over the place. Anyhow, the lady ends up getting fired and losing her job because of the way she was just verbally tearing down this other human being. It was awful. The, the words she was using were just terrible, just terrible. Listen, the words that we use have a massive impact on people's life, don't they? Have you ever noticed there's been times where you have a little anger rising up inside of you, and it's just like this one little thing tips the cup, and all of a sudden, some undeserving person receives the bulk of your anger. Nobody else? I did that the other day, actually, and I would tell you that story, but I'm too proud, and I I can't do it. I just can't do it. I will tell you this, that, that um, I was dealing with a contractor in my house, and, and uh, it took him forever to finally finish the job. I ended up yelling at him on the phone and calling him names, and now I didn't use any swear words, so I will like, say, hey, I did a good job there. But, but I, was, I misbehaved so poorly that I ended up calling them up after the job was done and scheduling an appointment to sit down with all of the people that were part of the job so I could sit down and apologize to them for the way that I treated them because, because it was so bad. Have you, have you guys ever done that where you lost your temper and you had to go back and apologize? Or how about when you knew you should have apologized, but you, you, you didn't? No, we all do. We, yeah, if you're a follower of Christ, right, of course, we're good Christians. We go, we'll go and apologize after we trash the person, right? It's funny, we live in a world now where you almost have to assume that the camera is on and the mic is hot all the time, right? You almost have to assume that. Everywhere that you go, somebody is a photojournalist, they're waiting with a device in their hand that they can shoot pictures and video and audio. You don't ever know, are you being recorded with what you're doing? In fact, in spaces where you think you're safe and you're having conversations, sometimes the mic is still on. In fact, we have, during the presidential campaign, we saw how uh, hidden video and audio came to the surface of, of these people on the campaign trail saying things that they didn't think that, that were being recorded, being aired on national TV. Imagine if your worst moments were recorded and aired on, on national TV. I tell you, I am so grateful that my worst moments are not recorded and aired on national television. I got to tell you that that our mouth and our words, they really matter. They really do. And, and so we have to be careful how we use our words. In fact, we try so hard, don't we, to, to, to control our tongue and to control our mouth, but there's just those times where we lose control. We try so hard to tame it, but it just seems untamable. In fact, Aesop's, Aesop's fables, the, these little short stories that, that I read when I was a kid, but there was one where once upon a time, a donkey found a lion's skin, and he tried it on, and he strutted around and frightened many animals. Soon a fox came along, and the donkey tried to scare him too. But the fox heard the donkey's voice and said, If you want to terrify me, you'll have to disguise your bray. 
<laughs> Aesop's moral of the story, clothes may disguise a fool, but his words will give him away. You know why I'm so passionate about this? Here's why I'm so passionate about this. It's because our words matter. This morning, you might be here and be a follower of Christ. Listen, your words matter. Your words matter. In fact, if you're a follower of Christ and people know it, they're gonna actually going to look at you a little bit differently thinking, are you a hypocrite or are you really following? Like, like what, what are your actions like? I got to tell you that when I went back in and scheduled the appointment with the contractors to sit down and apologize for the way that I talked to them, that in the middle of that, they said, so Mr. Williams, what do you do for a living? Well, you wouldn't know it by my actions, sir, but I'm a pastor of a church. And he's like, really? I'm like, yeah, I am. And, and, uh, and, I, and my actions didn't display that, you know? And so I'm sitting there with the general manager and the installation manager and the regional manager because my situation had escalated to that level. And I'm sitting there in the room with the three of them. And one of the guys says, you know, your actions today actually prove it. Your actions today prove it. We've been yelled at worse called worse names. We've had customers scream at us and do absolutely crazy things. You're the first person to ever schedule a face-to-face -face appointment to sit down and apologize to us and own, and own your end of it. Listen, your words matter. Even when you screw up, you can always come back and be like, hey, listen, I was wrong. Because I was wrong are three words that you just don't hear in the world. And when you're wrong, because you know what? I'm wrong. I, I'm imperfect. I'm not a perfect human. Many of you guys know that already, and if you don't, I'm sorry, but I, I, am, I am imperfect. But, but I'm telling you, listen, even when we screw up, we can humble ourselves and come back and use our, the words of our mouth to be able to help straighten some situations out. We really can. So we're in week number four of our series called Work It, and we've called it that because if you would put your faith to work, it works. It works if you work it. And so we're in the book of James, looking at how faith can be put into action in your life. And today we're going to be looking at the tongue. And so if you have your Bibles, you can go to James chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, you can go to James chapter 3. That's where we're at today. You know, what, what comes out of your mouth comes out of your heart, you know. <laughs> I've heard it said that what's in the well is what comes out in the bucket. When you start to pull that bucket up, you get what's inside of that well. And our goal as followers of Christ, and if you're not a follower of Christ here today, maybe you're just kicking tires, maybe you're checking this thing out, what is following Christ all about, what is being a Christian all about. Listen, today's a good day for you to come and investigate and see what, what this is about. Because when we are, as believers, our goal is to be, have a spiritual maturity level. And, and, and listen, a true mark of spiritual maturity is how you manage your words. Is how you manage your words. That, that is one of the markers of spiritual maturity. What are the words that come out of your mouth? So in James chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it says this, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. That's me with a contractor getting judged, yeah. So I'll tell you what, there's a lot of humble pie that I had to eat. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not st stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man able to also bridle his whole body. So we are all imperfect. Even me, we're all imperfect in this task. We try hard, right? We, we try to apply the scriptures and we try to say, hey, we want to control our tongue. But listen, it is difficult sometimes to control it. And we all stumble from time to time. And teachers, it says, are drug judged more strictly. And you're like, well, that's why you're the pastor, Matt. And that's why I sit there in the chair. No, listen, you guys at times are teachers, right? I mean, the Bible says that we should all be ones that go out and disciple other people. There's times where we, we are all the teacher. Maybe you don't stand on a stage with a microphone, but maybe you're in a small group in a living room with 10 or 15 people in your house. Maybe it's one-on-one -on -one over coffee. Maybe, maybe it's just a moment that you have with somebody just in the passing of life. There are times where every one of us become teachers in different areas of our life. And so there's a responsibility that goes with that. There's a responsibility that goes with that. As you rise up to the call of teaching others in, in the ways to follow Christ, there's a responsibility. You know, when you're in front of people, they tend to, uh, in, I mean, this is kind of a true statement anyways, but when, when you are a teacher, 
and you're teaching God's principles, you stand before God on a different standard. But when you're standing in front of men, you stand in front of them, and maybe they shouldn't judge you, but they do, don't they? They do. It's, it's kind of part of life. That's why it's so easy to pick on people who are famous. We have this weird thing in our country where we, we celebrate success, but we're almost like hate the, the successful. You, you know what I mean? Like, like we celebrate the idea of success and, and getting success, but when somebody actually rises to the top and they are successful in what they're doing, people start throwing rocks from all kinds of angles at them. It, it's really unbelievable. Billy Graham just died, and, and he was a great man who was 99 years old, and, and he preached the gospel all over the world, and he broke down all kinds of barriers. He broke down, I mean, in, intense barriers, but, but even in the midst of him doing all this good stuff, people were still throwing rocks at him. On the day that he died, there were people that were criticizing him. There were people celebrating his life, and people that were crit- even if Billy Graham, <laughs> like the preacher of all preachers, if, if, if that guy gets picked on, guess what? You're going to get it too. You're going to get it too. It's just, it's just what happens. So verse number three, if you put bits into the mouths of horses that are, so that, sorry, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and so driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. They're saying that the tongue is like the rudder of a boat. And I thought, well, how big is a rudder? I mean, I'm kind of more of a, I mean, I live in the desert. Let's get real, right? My boat experience is very low. And, and I know there's a thing in the back for the rudder to be able to steer it, right? But I didn't know, like, how big is this thing? And so I started Googling and internet searching because everything out there is, you know, true. And, and so, like, what percentage of the rudder is the boat? And, and, and I started doing some research, and I, and I learned that the rudder is roughly 2% of the underwater part of the boat. So whatever part of the boat is underwater, um, is, um, it's 2% of that part, right? But, but they said, well, we couldn't really judge the rudder size to the boat size because different boats have different water surface areas underneath of them, you know? And so, and so I'm trying to figure out the whole thing. And, and so then the question became, well, which, like, which boat is it? And I thought, well, you know, how much water. And so cruise ships, for example, they're pretty big. They're really tall above water, and then they sink down into the water pretty deep. But what about a little fishing boat? And so I started doing all this different math and trying to figure it out. And, and, and so, and then of course, along the way, it's like, well, how, how much of the boat is in the water? And then someone said, I, get, I bet the rudder for the Titanic is huge, right? Because it's all the way underwater. Or submarines. And, and so, <clears throat> so 20% of the boat is underwater. Right? So, so I know this is so lame, but here we go. 20% of the boat is underwater. Um, and the rudder is, or in the rudder is uh, five per, or 2% of that part. So 2% of the 20%, which means the rudder is, is roughly um, less than about one third of a percent, not even a whole percent, not even a half a percent, less than half of a percent of the boat is the rudder. That little thing can steer the massive ship. That little thing, that little bit of a percentage, right? This thing in your mouth, your tongue, what percentage of of your body is that thing? But that thing right there can steer your whole life in in, in a crazy way. So verse 5, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. (laughs) How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, sustaining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Oh, sounds intense. Your tongue is the spark that lights the forest fire. <clears throat> Your tongue is the corruption that, that can corrupt the, the whole body. In Matthew chapter 15, verses 10 and 11, it says, What comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. That's what Jesus said. It's, it's not what you do here or here. It's what comes out of your mouth that defiles a person. It comes from the heart. Your tongue sets the course for your life. And in verse 7, it says, For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. They can tame every kind of animal in the world. They can bag it and tag it. 
put it in a cage, charge you admission, and you can go to the zoo and look at it. Like they, they've got it tamed and somehow controlled in some way, don't they? Like everything out there, and that's what it's saying is, is you can tame, you can control anything out there, but your tongue is uncontrollable. Oh man, great news, Pastor Matt. I can't control my tongue, and I literally can't control my tongue. The Bible says that it's impossible. Your tongue is an untamed beast. The tongue is the monster that is in your mouth that just seems to rage and rage. Is it a lost cause? I mean, the destructive power that, that we have with our mouth, it, it can be so intense. I mean, is it a lost cause that, to try to even control the tongue? I'll tell you this, you can't tame it on your own. That's what I know. You can try, but you can't tame it on your own. Verses 9 it says, with, with it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Huh. We will bless God and curse man. We will bless God and curse God's creation. I mean, we'll sit here right now this morning and, and we'll sing songs about Jesus, and we'll sing songs about, about the Lord, and, and we'll, we'll raise our hands, right? And, and we'll worship with our mouths. We will speak blessings upon God. And five minutes later, we'll be in our car in the same parking lot of the church building, and that idiot just pulled out in the wrong place, and all of a sudden, the curses start to flow out. That guy's an idiot driver. Where'd he get his driver's license? For Cracker Jack box, like, come on, man, you know, the word, what happened back when I was your age, the standards were better. They didn't just give them out like candy, right? <clears throat> Verse 11, does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? No. Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. I got, I got three points for us this morning. Three points. If you're taking notes, you've got three points. And number one is this. Our words give us direction. Our words give us direction. Our words give us direction. I'm telling you this. If you change the way that you speak, you can change the direction of your life. If you change the way that you speak, you can change the direction of your life. If you're always complaining, if you're always pointing out the negative, guess what? You're just going to start seeing more and more of the negative. If you start to just constantly speak these kinds of things, your life will start to follow in that pattern. When you speak thankfulness and gratefulness for what God has already provided for you, you start to fill your life with joy and thanksgiving and gladness, not because of what you don't have, but because of what you do have. Your attitude changes, and, and you start to speak to yourself. Your life will change. Your direction will start to change when you start to change the way that you speak. In fact, Proverbs 18, 21 says the power of life and death is in the tongue. You can speak words of life or you can speak words of death over people. If you are constantly criticizing your kids, if you are constantly tearing them down, you will be speaking words of death into their life to where they will not amount to their full potential. Some of you may have grown up in a home where you had a parent or an aunt or an uncle or, or somebody that spoke negative words over you all the time, said you can't do it. You're just going to be average. You just, and you start to believe those things and you realize that the God-given potential that he's put inside of you, you never fully realize because of the power of the words that were spoken over you. Listen, you can change your direction when you change the way that you speak. Negative speaking creates a negative atmosphere. See, your words matter. And there are some words that matter more than others. In fact, I can prove it to you. There are some words that you will speak or that will be spoken over you that will change the direction of your life. Not even spiritually. Let's just look at it in the natural. You stand on a wedding altar and you say two words. You say, I do. That changes your direction of your life. When you're standing in a courtroom and the judge says, not guilty, changes the direction of your life, doesn't it? There's things that, that start to change the direction of your life. You, you go to the, to the doctor, you have tests done, and you come back, and they say the results that, that you are cancer-free. 
You're like, oh man, that just changed the direction of my life. Because if they had said you have cancer, cancer positive, that's a different direction than saying cancer free. Listen, the words start to make a difference and start to matter. And here's where it matters in your spiritual life. You see, when temptation comes along and you say no to temptation, the, traject- the, the, the direction of your life changes. And when you say yes to Jesus, the direction of your life changes. I'm telling you, the words that come out of your mouth matter. The things that you speak matter. Your tongue is an important thing. It reminds me of a a young man who decided to become a monk, and so he went to the monastery, and he signed up for a uh, three-year internship, and it was a three-year vow of silence. Three years, no nothing, no silence. And they said, okay, at the end of each year, you'll have a performance review, and you can say two words at the end of each year. And so he gets to the end and he's in front of the head guy and head monk and, and, he, and he, they kind of talk about what's happening and they said, so at the end of your first year, what are the two, years, two words you want to say? And he says, thanks, Sarah. He says, bed hard. <laughs> Turns around, walks out and they're like, okay, you know, so another year passes, same thing. He's standing there and he says, food cold. And then he walks away, and, and, and they're like, man, this guy, okay, you know. And so a whole other year, third year goes by. He's finally standing there, and they say, hey, you're completing your third year, your vow, three-year vow of silence. What are, you, what, are your last, what are your words? And he says, I quit. And he walks out. And they say, yeah, they're not really surprised. They said, all you've ever done is complain around here. James says that it's impossible for a human to control his own tongue. But the good news is this, is that the same power that conquered the grave lives inside of you if you're a believer. You see, the Spirit of God will dwell inside of you, and you have a power and access to the power of the Holy Spirit that can help you. It can help you to control your tongue. In fact, in Colossians 3, it says that whatever you do in word and deed, do everything in the name of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. You see, when we put Christ first... It's in what we do and what we say when we put Christ first. See, growing, growing Christians learn how to put Christ first. Growing Christians learn how to submit their body, even the little tongue, under the power of the Holy Spirit. We learn how to do this thing. Number two is this. Our words can bring destruction. Number one is our words can change direction, determine direction. But number two is they can bring destruction. You see, just a small spark can destroy such a large thing. It says in here that an evil tongue will defile the whole body. The tongue can start a hellfire that can never be put out. You know, you can't bring those words back. You can't, you can't like, suck them back in and shove them back down your throat hole as if they never happened. Like, you know, like, like you can't put it back. In fact, when I was in student ministry running middle school and high school students, we used to do this illustration all the time, and we would take a tube of toothpaste, and we would, we would, we would put it out, and we would say, okay, let's squeeze that toothpaste all the way out, you know, and we'd have a game, and they'd be like, yeah, yeah, okay, got okay, the first person that can put every drop of that toothpaste back in the tube wins. Well, you can't do it. Once it's out, you can't get it back in. It's the same thing with your words. Once it's out, you can't get it back in. You can't undo it. I wish you could. And your spouse may forgive you. They may say, I I, I forgive you for the words that you said, but the words were still said. Forgiveness and forgetting are, are two different things. Sometimes you forgive somebody for the way that they treated you, but you don't forget. And so there's a few different kinds of words. Sometimes they're careless words careless words. You know, they don't mean to cause damage and harm. They're kind of the hit and run words, you know, like, like the careless words. They just kind of toss out the words and, and, and you don't, they don't even know the damage that they're creating, but it just wrecked you on the inside. All of us have had fallen victim to those people, the hit and run drivers that, that throw the, the careless words. What I want to say too is you may have been a hit and run word thrower and not even realized it. There may be people in your life that say, hey, when you said this, it really hurt me. And you might have to just say, well, that's, that's not what I meant. You know, you, in your head, you're saying, that's not what I meant. I don't, did I really say that? That doesn't sound like me. I think they're making it up, you know, and, and, and I, I don't know. No, you're, no. And then the, the way you handle that is important. 
I mean, when they say that, hey, you said those things and it really hurt me, the best response is just to say, I'm so sorry. I didn't want to hurt you. Like, that's, I, I'm so sorry that that hurt you. I, didn't, I don't remember even saying that, but I'm so sorry. Like, it doesn't, you know, and will you please forgive me? Sometimes you've been the victim of a hit and run. Sometimes you've perpetrated the hit and run with the careless words. You can destroy lives in minutes with those kinds of words. There's the angry and hostile words. Those are the words that you know you said in anger. They're not the careless, oops, did that come out of my mouth word. That's the pre-planned, you know, when you're in the shower washing and you're replaying the scenario over and over in your head. My friend says he calls it making movies, you know, and then you rewrite the script over and over and over again. And then in this perfect scenario, you've timed everything that they're going to say. And then you have the perfect rebuttal. Don't look at me like that. You guys have done this, (laughs) right? I'm not the only one, right? So, but you know, like we've all done this thing where we, we do this thing and you pre-plan it. And then when the opportunity comes and they actually say the thing that, that you imagined in your head, you're like, holy cow, here it is. This is like T-ball. You just set the thing right here. And I'm like, oh, boom, you know, and you just dump all over them and you hammer it out, you know, and you just, blah, the anger comes out and the forest fire of, of destruction comes out of your mouth and you start to just destroy that other person. We've all seen it happen. Many of us in the room have actually done it. Maybe all of us in the room. Maybe it was just in your head. But we've all done it. Listen, those words are the angry words. The angry words. Those words are easy to see and spot. Those words are the ones that you you criticize from a distance even. In fact, those are the words, like how many women have been beaten down verbally by men who just verbally abuse them with their angry words? You know what I mean? Like like, like that's the kind of thing you see all the time. How many kids had to deal with a parent who was angry and and just used angry words and grew up in a home where there was fighting and tension and, and hostility all the time? Those words, they wound. They cut deep and they bleed. Those are the words that that are easy to spot, the angry words. The babbling words, those are the ones that, uh, let's, let's just call it what it is, it's gossip. The gossiping words, the babbling words, those are the words where you, you know that you have the information on somebody and, and, and it, maybe, maybe you say, hey, will you help me pray for this person? They've been going through Blank, 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 blank. Let's just lift them up in prayer. (laughs) It's gossip and it's wrong. Maybe you've partaken in gossip. Or maybe you've been the receiving end of gossip. If you're on the receiving end, it's real easy to stop. You just got to tell them, hey, I, I think... This might be a little too much. I, you know, I don't really need to know all those details. I don't, please, don't, please don't tell me that. Don't let your ears be the garbage can for their gossip. Don't let people put trash in there. And then these words you hear, depending on your work environment, there's filthy words. If you're working in construction, these are the words you know that y- y- there's like ratings on TV shows based on these kinds of words being used. You know what I mean? Like, like there's words here where, you know, th- these are the words that everybody goes, oh, well, those are the bad words. Those are the obvious ones, right? The words that are coming up. But if you have the filthy words coming out of your mouth, you've got to understand that the bucket is drawing from the well, right? So if, if what's coming out of your mouth is what's actually in your heart, we can tame the, an- the animals of the world, but the monster in your mouth is so difficult to control, isn't it? So difficult to control. Our words display our character, is number three. So blessing and cursing coming out of the same mouth. You know, there's some great people in the Bible that had great trouble with their tongues as well. In fact, you can look and you can see all through Scripture, some of the heroes like Moses, um, like Isaiah, like like Job. You see how they even struggled at times. Even David with, with, with his words sometimes struggled to be able to have a clean mouth by which to speak from. So is it sweet or is it salt water that's coming out of your mouth? Last week we talked about how the root brings the fruit in your life. 
And what roots you're feeding determine what kind of fruit you're going to be producing in your life. Your mouth is the same way. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12 that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you're having trouble with your tongue, putting more rules on your tongue doesn't actually fix it. Word issues, mouth issues, tongue issues, those are all being driven from your heart. It's a heart issue. It's what's in the heart that it needs to be changed and needs to be adjusted. You can bleep out the bad words, but, 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 but still, at, in the inside, there's a heart issue that needs to be adjusted and changed. You see, the source is in the heart. And so if your words are harsh, then you have an angry heart. If, if, if your words are negative, then, then you're dealing with some anxiety inside of your heart. If, if you have an overactive mouth, maybe you have an unsettled heart. If you have a filthy mouth, maybe you have an impure heart. If you have a very critical mouth on other people, maybe you're living with a lot of bitterness. But you see, just like those things are true, the other side of the equation is true too. You see, if you have a mouthful of compassion, then, then you have a loving heart. And if you have a mouth that's encouraging and lifting up other people, then you have a happy heart. And, and if you speak the truth in love, then, then you have an honest heart. Listen, it's a heart issue that drives what comes out of your mouth. And so sometimes we, we sit and we call on God and we say, God, I need you to help with my mouth. And God is saying, listen, what you really need is a heart transplant. What you really need is a, is a new heart because God's in that business. He's in the restoration business. He's in the business of helping change out the hearts of people. Sometimes we look at the fruit and forget what the root is. The only way to change the tongue is to get a new heart. Transformation is the solution. We must have a new life and a new heart. If the band would come, I'm going to close now. Transformation is the solution. You see, we need a new life. See, as a holy, you have to ask the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, to come in and to help control your heart. In fact, in Psalms chapter 141, it says, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth, and keep a watch over the door of my lips. In Psalms 19, it says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be accepted in your, acceptable in your sight. So church, we need to be able to use our tongue for God's glory. We got to be able to use our words to magnify Christ. We use our words for praise and, and for worship, for speaking life into other people's lives, speaking life and not speaking death. You see, worship flows out of our hearts. And if we're struggling to worship with our mouth, maybe because our heart needs a change and our heart needs a transformation. The fruit is always marked by what the tree, by the tree that produces it. You see, the grapevine is not going to produce oranges. And the orange tree is not going to produce avocados. You see this all through nature. And sometimes the fruit that's coming out of us, the, the fruit that's hanging on our branches, is, is stuff that, that we don't necessarily want to see in our life. And so we have to address the root system of what's going on inside of our heart. It doesn't mean we all have to talk the same. It doesn't mean we all use the same words. In fact, there's different species within fruit trees. I don't know if you know that. There's different like families of fruit. In fact, if you go look at like orange trees, there's, there's like a, the citrus family. There's over 100 different kinds of citrus. I went and looked it up, Googled it. There's over 100 different kinds of citrus of fruits that are out there. You know, between the lemon and, and the lime and the orange and the tangerine and the, and the grapefruit and, and lots of things I can't even pronounce. Grown in countries, I don't know where they're at. But, but there's all kinds of different things. You see, we're part of the family of God. And we're part of that, that system. We're part of that environment. And, 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 and my speak may look a little different than your speak. And, and we may not all have exactly the same vernacular all the time. But there's a family thing that happens when you're into the family of Christ. When you're grafted into the family of God, there's a thing that happens. You see, here's the good news. 
You see, we can't control our tongue no matter how hard we try. Even God's word says it, and you know it's true because you have been trying. But the good news is this, is that, you see, when Jesus came down to earth, what he did for us was he gave us a way to have a new heart. He was in the heart transplant business. And so for maybe for you, God, you, you, you have followed Christ and, and maybe you've allowed your heart to become polluted with things of this world. Maybe you've grown bitter because of the things that have happened in your life. Maybe, the, maybe your heart has grown hard from things and experiences that you've had. And the evidence is coming out now in the way that you speak, the negativity that comes out of your mouth, the words that are destructive and hurtful, maybe the anger that's coming out, the different things that are coming out of your mouth. You're saying, yeah, Matt, I understand. Like, I get that. I, I see some of those words coming out of my mouth right now. Listen, I'm not telling you to control your tongue. I'm telling you to surrender your heart to the Lord and he will restore your heart. He will transplant your heart. He will clean out the impurities. He will bring you a new heart and a new life and a new mind and he will start to change the inside so that it will come back out through the outside. You see, God isn't about putting rules around you to control your inside. He knows that if he can have access to your, to your outside, he knows that if he can have access to your inside, it will just naturally start to happen. It will just naturally start to happen. The difference between a religion and relationship is that. You see, religion says, I put more rules in place to control my behavior. A relationship with God, it says, hey, let me just bring you a new heart. And the Prince of Peace and the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, and, and the God that, that surpasses all understanding, everything that, that God does, He wants to come on the inside and change you there. And He knows that if He changes you there, it's just a matter of time before things start to work their way out into your branches. He wants to change your roots. He wants to, yeah, He does. You might be here this morning, and you've never made a decision to follow God. Or maybe you made that decision and you walked away and it's been a long time since you've been back. The good news is he says, hey, you can come back to the family. You've been growing avocados and he says, yeah, you know, come on back. You want some oranges again? You want to be part of the citrus family like the rest of us? Come, come on over. Listen, I can graft you right back into the family. God welcomes you with open arms. He doesn't criticize what's happened in your life. You haven't gone too far. You haven't done too much wrong. He just says, come on, come on back. I want to give you a new heart. And maybe in the process of that new heart, it might take a little while for the avocados to fall off the branches and the oranges to start to grow again. But if you work on the heart, you work on the root, the root will eventually start to produce the fruit. And that's what James is saying here. Is that you can't control your tongue. But the good news is that your tongue comes out of your heart, and I know of a guy that can change your heart. There's power in your words. The power of life and death is in the tongue. So speak wisdom, speak knowledge, speak encouragement, and speak blessing. There's lots of little words that we can use to, to speak these kinds of things. Like, I miss you, I love you. I respect you. Maybe you're right. That's a good one. You should try that one on. <laughs> Please forgive me. It's another one. That works pretty well. I thank you. You can count on me. Hey, let me help you. I understand you. These are words that you can speak. Maybe put your arm around your kid today and just say, I'm proud of you. There's words of life that you can speak over the people in your life. Will you stand with me as we sing?